Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, this webcast is called Secure Configuration Management Demystified. I am Bobby Steffes with the SANS Institute and will be moderating this uh, webcast. Today's featured speaker is speakers are uh, Mr. Michael B. Lander, Product Marketing Director at Tripwire, and Dave Shackelford. Uh, he's a SANS Senior Instructor and Founder of Voodoo Security. Uh, before I turn things over to Michael, Thander, and Dave, uh, the Q&A portion will take place at the end of the webcast. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the uh, chat window. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce our future speakers, uh, Michael Thelander and Dave Shackelford. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for the introduction. This is Michael Thelander here from Tripwire, Product Marketing Director at Tripwire for Tripwire Enterprise, particularly. Dave, are you there? some audio, it's breaking up a little bit. So this is Michael again. I'm going to go ahead and start off the slide progression. Dave is going to have to dial back in in just a second here. So I'm going to kick this off and talk about secure configuration management demystified. Um, and I want to talk about this concept of locking down configuration items, locking down configuration parameters again and again and again. The conversation actually keeps happening. If you look back, back in 2004, a Gartner paper came out that said that recommended for host security that configuration management was highly successful in stopping attacks and actually said that 65% of successful attacks were attributed to configuration issues. So this happens again and again and again and really periodic points throughout the years until now, seven years later in 2011, Gartner came out with another paper recently um, focused on how to devise a server protection strategy and how that server protection strategy would be different uh, from servers versus desktops. And it was really amazing because the number one priority for server protection as compared to desktops or anything else was really around secure configuration management. There's a lot of other items on that list from, um, from managing patches, of course, to appropriate firewall settings. Uh, and it varies widely between uh, servers and desktops. But on the server side, the most important item that they finger pointed, uh, pointed to was really managing those secure configurations. Um, and largely as a preventive measure, of course, uh, but also due to the dynamic nature of where the servers are in the data center, where they sit, and how close they are to the data that we're so desperately trying to protect. Um, and really, when you look it at the SAN top, top 20, 20. Uh, there's a little bit of feedback, feedback there. there. Back online, are we getting audio now? I think we've got audio there. A lot of organizations out in the world still lack a sound configuration and patching program. I want to point to um, an Information Week survey that actually came out in March, March or April it came out. And Information Week is probably not my number one source of information for IT security information. But this survey uh, that they've done in successive years now, the last couple of years, is actually pretty revealing. Over a 1,000, or right around uh, just less than a 1,000 in 2011 over 1,000 for 2012 security professionals ranging from system admins to security directors and CISOs are asked what are the biggest challenges, what are the biggest security challenges that they face. Um, and there's a lot of sort of 
uh, normal suspects on that list from insider threats to stopping external breaches. But one of the things that actually came up was that really the number one item was controlling the vast complexity of modern IT security configurations and, and uh, organizations. But the second was managing, um, really enforcing security policies across the organization, both at a technical level as well as a personal level. Um, the, the, the long and short of the story being that it's extremely, extremely difficult to do. It's hard to do not just from the perspective of how many configuration items are in a server or in uh, network devices, but the complexity of those across the environment, across the infrastructure. Most environments today have two or three different kinds of platforms that are involved, whether it's Red Hat and Windows and a Solaris box here or there. They've also got database configurations to contend with, as well as network devices to continue, contend with. When you take all of those configurations for all these disparate devices and roll it across very large organizations that are geographically distributed, it makes it really, really difficult. Um, to manage it in anything like an ongoing or a consistent way. Let's see if we've got Dave back on the phone yet, or voice yet. Nothing yet. Okay. Let's talk about breaches that we've seen largely due to configuration errors. And I personally am not a big fan of using sort of breach du jour tactics to scare people. And I wouldn't present any of these in this way as, as a, sort of a scare tactic to drive people to do secure configuration management. But the data is pretty explicit. There's a breach from the Utah Department of Health in 2012, the most recent of these. 200 and a quarter of a million social security numbers do uh, expose, do primarily to configuration errors in the systems holding that information. Dropbox, that uh, rather large, um, noisy, noisy in terms of getting a lot of attention in the world breach that occurred in 2011, largely due to configuration errors that provided access to other users' data. Sony, there's going to be litigation around Sony and discovery around Sony and all the things that happened there for probably many, many years. Uh, but a significant piece of that is also due to configuration errors. And I think more specifically, the inability of systems that do the detection to be able to also uh, manage configurations and know when configurations are misaligned or not put together properly. If we look at uh, Verizon's data breach investigation report, this has become sort of the de facto standard for um, my first, uh, uh, the de facto standard for how organizations, um, where breach information comes from, for doing dissection of those breaches. I have a message here, moderate. I can't hear anybody else actually coming through. Anybody else getting voice or audio right now? Emilia does. Thank you very much. OK, thanks. I appreciate it. All right, so let me continue. Uh, is Dave on yet? Nothing yet. OK. Verizon's data breach investigation report. So of all of the attacks in 2011, they came up with some data that gets repeated again and again. 92% um, attacks are not highly difficult. The data was compromised primarily from servers. This figure keeps coming up again and again when we say 96% of breaches are avoidable through simple or intermediate controls. That's a very bold, that's a broad statement. Um, but what do we call simple or in, in, uh, intermediate controls? Logging is certainly a simple or immediate intermediate control. And really, security configuration management, being able to manage configurations across the enterprise is a simple or immediate intermediate control. In 2012, almost exactly the same number. So it's not really a question of getting any better. In fact, it's getting a little bit worse. If you look at this information in detail, and we dig into what the data breach investigation report says, I quote from them, remote access services continue their rise, accounting for 88% of all breaches that leveraged hacking. Those things, remote access services, the ability to access you know, RDP access to other systems outside of a server or where the configurations are managed, that's the kind of thing that configuration management is designed to help. These are the kinds of controls and the kind of access. Oh, hang on one second. I'm going to pause. There's audio. Are you there, Dave?
Dave, are you there? There. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear I hear you, Dave. There's Dave. Okay. Excellent. Oh, sorry about that, folks. So, uh, yeah. Looks like uh, look, looks like just enough of the hurricane managed to uh, come my way to cause massive massive uh, internet problems where I'm at. So, oh, my perfect. apologies. But uh, <laughs> I, I think we'll eventually have everybody on audio. I know it's amazing technology. Uh, so, in any case, uh, can, can everybody hear me? Can we just test here. Yeah, I can hear you, Dave. Dave, can you hear me? This is Michael. Okay, uh, I'll assume everybody can hear me. That's good. So I'll, I'll just pick this up, and I know uh, Michael will be back in just a second, too. He's just having to dial in on the same line since we uh, had to go to a, a Plan B audio there. But in any case, I'll just start uh, you know, kind of chatting about what he was speaking about a moment ago. Um, you know, I think everybody's pretty familiar with the DBIR, right? So most people have at least taken a glance through this thing. If you haven't, really poured through it, uh, you know, in all the specifics and all of its spectacular statistical glory, then you might have missed some of the finer points that are buried down in there. But these are some of the interesting things that I think we've seen trending pretty consistently for the last couple of years. I mean, the, the challenge we face is that, if, you know, you look at the news and you look at all of these spectacular scenarios that are happening. I mean, today, you know, there it is. Out there in the news, you've got a uh, Java, you know, zero day that's circulating and, and it's in the wild and everybody's, you know, kind of pushing the panic button and every, uh, you know, uh, person that's writing articles in the area of information security is talking about this stuff. But if you really look at the data itself, specifically around the things that are coming out from Verizon and, and these kind of similar guys, it's really the simple stuff that's killing us. Um, I mean, it's just pretty amazing to me that this low-hanging fruit, as we typically refer to this, is really what constitutes the bulk or at least a significant portion of the breaches that we're seeing consistently over the years. And this slide right here in front of you, I think, illustrates that pretty well, as, as Michael was kind of alluding to just a minute ago. Um, you know, 80, 88 percent of breaches leveraging hacking, well, well, they had something to do with remote access services. I mean, you know, I can actually speak from experience here as a penetration tester. Uh, you know, one of my classic favorite quotes that uh, a client actually, came, uh, you know, gave to me when we were sitting at a findings meeting was, wow, I forgot we had VNC installed on that server. I'm like, well, you know what? I didn't forget about it. I found it. And I'm sure any other attacker that's out there really paying attention would probably find that without too much trouble either. Uh, so this is just one of those clear cases where simple things are really, uh, you know, causing us more headaches than we should be experiencing here in 2012. You would certainly think at this point we'd have things like configuration management and just sound system imaging and so forth down pretty well, but uh, the data shows otherwise. Right? We're not really seeing that kind of thing happen, and same thing involves passwords. I mean, uh, let alone the fact that you've got people like LinkedIn and some of these other very well-known services that aren't even using salt in their passwords, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we've got people still setting up really simple ones like ABCD1234 and, and similar kinds of passwords. So, Michael, are you online now? I am online. Hey, Dave, how you doing? Hey, great. Yeah, sorry about that. The audio snap. We, we did we beat the hurricane. We beat the hurricane, at least so far. We should probably wait till the end before we declare that, but... <laughs> Um, you know, you made a point about the complexity and that story that you just told about the gentleman that, you know, we didn't know that VNC was enabled or installed on that server. That, that's, that is a great example of the very first data point that we used where Information Week says, what's the number one concern, the vast complexity of the information security systems? You have so many tools deployed and so much interdependency between those tools that it's easy to say objectively, yeah, of course we should not have RDP enabled on any of these systems or VNC. Yeah, of course not. However, how, how do you know? And you've got so you're, you're running at the speed of light, basically, to try to enable systems for the business. How do you know when those connections are made, and how how frequently do you assess the safety of those connections? I think that's the big issue behind configuration, you know, secure configuration management. Yeah, I'd agree. I, you know, I think it's those th it's things we take for granted, right? A lot of organizations, especially as they get bigger and more sprawled, uh, you know, you just kind of lose track of some of those basic things. But unfortunately, they're uh, they're coming back and biting us. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I, I've moved this on here, and I think really this is just taking us one step deeper into some of the data that these guys produce. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is that there's a, you know, at least from the people I talk to, I mean, I, I know both of us you know, give, a lot of, give a lot of talks and, and go to a lot of conferences and, and attend a lot of industry events and security. 
And I, I don't know about you. I mean, I, I would guess probably the same thing that I tend to experience. It seems like a lot of people just fall prey to this fallacy that, uh, you know, it's these really cutting edge attack techniques and, and really, you know, amazing new things that you're always reading about that are the problem. But again, here's the data, right? I mean, you look at what these guys are compiling and uh, it tells a very different story. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, but I think it is telling, you know, the fact that you've got uh, social tactics, you've got malware. I mean, I think trying to put your finger on one definitive source of breaches or, you know, specific cause is actually getting more and more difficult because all these things are starting to overlap a bit, right? So, right. you know, yeah, there you go. And this so is an example. Thing. Yeah, where you yeah. use, you know, there's two things that you're trying to control. You're trying to uh, control, you know, stolen or guessable password credentials also with the ability to enable and, and establish backdoors. When you combine those two together, you get a very successful system. And the, what they're pointing out here is that attacks continue to combine those two different methods. Yeah, and that's, you know, and that's, it, it, what's interesting to me is that, um, you know, having been a professional incident responder and, and also a professional attacker, uh, you know, for what that's worth, um, it just amazes me that even with all of this, you know, talk of APTs and advanced threats and these kinds of things, 99% of the attacks out there still drop code on the box, right? They still attack the system in some way. They make changes. They, they you know, affect the system materially. It, you know, the, the problem, I think, too, is that uh, people just lose sight of this. So, you know, you talk about back doors. I mean, would you know if there was a back door on your system? You would say, oh, yeah, probably so. But if you're one admin with 500 systems to maintain, you know, there's a pretty good chance you might not. If you're, you know, at least, if, you know, if you're not paying attention or have the right kinds of controls in place to be able to both uh, prevent and detect that. So I, I think let's kick this thing off, right? Um, you know, as far as... Talking about breach data, I, I heard what you were saying uh, a minute ago when I was unable to speak, unfortunately. I, I kind of agree with you. I, I think people have, uh, you know, kind of gotten desensitized to these presentations that always start off with some sort of breach data, which is like, hey, check it out. Here's big breaches that have happened. And, and you literally can't read the news today uh, without reading about these things. But the, the story is pretty clear. I mean, you know, just because these breaches have happened doesn't mean that it's still not interesting to understand exactly what happened, at least in some of the cases where we have lots of data, as far as what led to that, right? And this is kind of taking us into our next phase of the webcast, where uh, I think we've kind of set the stage. You know, what is secure configuration management? Because I, I know a lot of people are a little confused on this. Yeah, and I get these questions all the time, basically, in terms of, well, uh, SANS calls it one thing, and NSA is calling it another thing, and of course it appears in virtually every uh, regulatory standard, whether you're looking at HIPAA or, or um, NERC standards, NERC SIP standards, or PCI, it's, it shows up in those, but it's always a different name. Yeah, exactly, and, and unfortunately, I mean, Although conceptually, I think there's some base fundamental things that we're, we're going to talk about here in a few minutes that, that can kind of, uh, you know, underscore what it is. If you're beholden to, you know, PCI standards or if you've got to follow NIST standards, then you're going to tend to use that nomenclature specifically when you're developing controls and policies within your organization and trying to maintain those. And so, uh, you know, especially, well, the real challenge, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what you guys are seeing across your customers and our folks. Most organizations have to have more than one, right? So it's pretty rare to find somebody that's just beholden to one standard today. Um, is, is that causing some confusion when people are trying to map these things across one and the other? It really does, and it, it causes no end of headache. And I think the uh, latest data that I saw both in terms of our own primary research and our customer base and then outside of that as well is about 80% of organizations out there and certainly in our customer base need to adhere to three or more guidelines, policy standards, or, regula or regulations depending on where they are in their either state standards or they're based on industry like HIPAA. A great example is healthcare organizations that are also under SOX compliance. So the, right there you've got PCI, SOX, HIPAA, plus probably some state regulations all in one place. And really, the regulations are looking at uh, controls that are fundamental across all of these different regulation sets, but they're all named a little bit differently. They're measured a little bit differently. And customers are really asking us for a way to, how do I normalize that across all of these controls? How do I, um, 
how do I take what is a, a known good standard established on this system that happens to be for a HIPAA requirement for confidentiality of information, but then blend that with TCI standards that I've got elsewhere in my organization so that I can say, yes, I have control over my infrastructure. And it's a very difficult task to normalize all that information and map the policies. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, well, yeah, that's probably an understatement. <laughs> Calling that very difficult is probably being kind, right? Yeah. Right on. So let, let's talk about what it is. Um, yeah, you know, and, and by the way, just to everybody that's out there listening, uh, you know, these are, you know, fairly standard. I, I hate using the word standard here because there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice this. But I, I would say that the, the categories listed here, the specific topical areas that typically define secure configuration management, almost, you, you know, almost always fall into these specific areas. Mike, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a good okay. list. Okay. Yeah, I reckon also. Let's start at the beginning. Um, you know, it shouldn't be a shocker or a surprise to anybody that's out there that, uh, you know, configuration management planning and, and just the overall management process of everything that's involved is probably one of the biggest headaches. And I think this is a challenge for a lot of organizations that are looking to get a real start in secure configuration management because it seems like such a daunting task, right, just to, just to kind of define exactly what it is you want to keep up with, the specific configuration components and CMDBs. Um, you know, so I, one of the things I tend to see, and, uh, Michael, I'm curious from you guys' perspective what, what you've seen as well, do you tend to find that a lot of organizations that are really putting a true CMDB or configuration management database in place and really defining a, at a very granular level, what they want to look at and maintain, is that usually driven by, uh, like, ITIL initiatives, or is it just a sense of best practice? Yeah, to the extent that it is enabled and initiated by a large number of organizations, it is largely driven by something like ITIL. Unfortunately, it tends to lose steam. And what we've seen in many, many cases is those that have great intentions to really run their business